so that we can have um, a class session with notes for a student who had to miss class. So um, today, uh, let's uh, let's look. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, go ahead and screen share. Is this uh, if I if I hit the? Can you all read this? Uh, uh, there were some reviews in a previous class period saying that it was kind of blurry. Um, but if you can read this, then then good. Otherwise, I'll just share. I'll just share the screen. How about that? I'll just share the screen. There we go. Um, I want to open my chat window. And that'll be kind of it. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let's see. So there are some announcements. There are some announcements. Um, I made I made a, a request. If you email me about like an assignment or something that you want me to look into or check up on for you, please, please, uh, would would you do me a favor and um, just tell me which which uh, which class period you're in? I know, like, it. I know I should. I know I should know. I know I should know, but it helps um, because I, I don't. I don't just know all that yet necessarily. So please, just like, just mention it. Just be like, period six, if you email me. Um, and because see, look, I'm in period four, right there, and this is period six. This is period six. But that went out to every class. My cat's here. My cat's here. Um, so that's that's the announcement uh, for classwork. We have two different. Uh, let's see. We have a lab. We have a lab. We'll go over that in a moment. We'll go over that in a moment. There's a video, and we have this other thing. Percent yield, and that's this one here. And and this tells us. Uh, let's see. Okay, so so remember uh, remember when yesterday we um, we went over what a theoretical yield is and what a limiting reagent is. So this is stoichiometry percent yield. Percent yield. I need to turn on my drawing tablet. So yesterday we talked about a theoretical yield. I'm going to switch colors. We talked about a theoretical yield and something called a limiting reagent. And I want to revisit what everyone has in their minds about what each of these things is, because there seemed to be some confusion. There, there may have been some confusion about this. So what, um, what, what would you say? So what's, uh, how about, how about limiting? Re Let's start with limiting reagent. What is the limiting reagent? Sorry. Limiting reactant. A reagent is a chemical in a bottle. A reactant is a chemical in a reaction. What is the limiting reactant in a molecular formula? Any ideas? You can type them in the chat. You can say them out loud. Determines the theoretical yield and given reaction. So that's that's uh, that's close. It's related. It's related to the theoretical yield. It does determine the theoretical yield. You can't get any more of a theoretical yield than you can get from the limiting reactant. Um, but I wanna I wanna I wanna kind of clarify that. 
I'll, I'll, I want to ask one more one more thing too, and this is also going to become an announcement in Google Classroom. Please, 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 please start typing stuff to the general chat, especially, especially if I have an external observer here. Especially if I, it would really help me out. I'll go into more detail about that in, uh, in the the um, the announcement that I make. Um, but it's okay, a couple things, it's okay to be wrong, it's okay to be wrong. I want everyone being comfortable being wrong or not quite right because it's, it, that's part of the thinking process, that's part of the learning process, is getting stuff wrong and being like, oh, like, no, not quite that, so like refining an idea is part of the learning process. The other thing is if you have a question or something that you didn't quite understand, please, please, please let me know. And it's, it's a, there's a good chance that if you're confused, someone else is too. So once again, it's okay to be confused. I want you to please be okay with being confused about things. And honestly, like, I'm the teacher here, it's my fault if you're confused. It's my fault. So you got to let me know so that I can do my job and try to explain things in a different way. Okay, please, 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 please. Um, all right, so limiting reactant. What did we say last time? We kind of said like, this is the thing that runs out first, right? The thing that runs out first. It's the reactant that runs out first. It limits the reaction. Reactant. That runs out first. And we had a bunch of different examples. We had a candle that burned out when we put a, a jar over it because the oxygen in the jar ran out. The oxygen was the limiting reactant. So the theoretical yield, so the theoretical yield most notably about the theoretical yield is that this thing is a product and it's a quantity of a product. And the reactant, as the name might imply, the reactant is a reactant. The reactant is, it's one of the reactants. It's the reactant that runs out first. The theoretical yield, it's a quantity of product. Specifically, specifically, it is the amount, it's like the max amount of product that we can get from the limiting reagent. Max amount of product so like if 100% of limiting reactant is converted, is like reacted, converted to product, is converted to product. All right. So the theoretical yield, it's a quantity of a product and it's the max amount of that product that we can get if all 100% of the limiting reactant gets converted. The limiting reactant is just the reactant that we run out of first so it limits the reaction. Had to reset the router, messed up, no problem, no problem. All right. So, with that in mind, what happens 
what happens if we're in in the real like really real world what if what if what if what if we have we like measure a product measure a quantity of product uh, oh ha. measure a quantity of product and um and it's it's less <laughs> I, the, it apostrophe it is less less than the theoretical yield what if we do that uh, Well, congratulations. If we do that, then we ha we're actually in the real world. We like never, ever, it never happens. The theoretical yield never happens. That says theoretical. Theoretical. All right. Don't scribble over stuff. Never happens. It's just, it's just theoretical. It's like, what if all of this, we know how much reactant we have. We're going to react it. We'll see how much product we get, and then we measure it, and it's like, oh, we didn't get what we expected. Um, but that's okay. Uh, what we get is, uh, that's called the observed yield or actual yield, observed yield, actual yield. What else can we call it? You know, it's the yield that you see. It's the yield that we get. It's the observed or actual yield. And um, what we can do then, what we can do once we have that, is uh, we, can, we can compare. We can compare the observed yield or the actual yield. So we'll take that actual yield and we'll divide that value by the theoretical yield. We'll divide it by the theoretical yield. Because that actual yield, it should always be less than the theoretical yield. Should always be less. Be less than theoretical yield. And um, it, if you're wondering, like, w w what if it's more? What if? Because that's a big should right there. Should always. What if it's more? What if it's more? I'm just going to say, w what if? yeah, what if it's more? What if? I'll let you guys think about it. What if it's more? What, what if you do an experiment and you get more actual yield than you calculated from your theoretical yield? What then? So we'll take that ratio, that, that fraction, and we'll multiply it by 100 to get the percent yield. And the percent yield is the main topic of today's discussion. And we're going to be, uh, let's see, that is, it's like a measure of the completeness or the efficiency completeness or efficiency of the reaction uh, 
of the reaction, Rxn means reaction. So our percent yield gives us an idea of how, how complete our reaction is. It's not quite efficiency because efficiency also implies things like how fast it goes and that sort of thing. But the completeness, the com how complete a reaction we have is a good, uh, like this is a good way to talk about how, how complete our reaction was. Actual yield should always be less than theoretical yield. And with that, uh, let's look at our screen grab. Um, so let's see, we have, we, we talked about actual yield, we talked about theoretical yield, we talked about percent yield, we have this formula for calculating percent yield, we talked about that, and now let's, uh, let's copy this example, and I'll paste it here. And I'm just gonna I'm just gonna leave it like tiny because that's just kind of how it has to be. If I if I mess with it too much, all the formatting goes weird. So so we have this example. It's it's all color coded and convenient. So we have this example: calcium carbonate decomposes. It's the reaction type. Decomposes into calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. And we, uh, the example wants us to calculate the percent yield if we get 97.5 grams of carbon dioxide, if we recover that from using 235.0 grams of calcium carbonate. And there's a prompt to start with the balanced chemical equation. So let's go ahead and do that. Our reactants or our products are labeled, so I'm just going to go ahead and write them. We have CA, I'm going to switch colors. Let's go with blue. Blue, we do, we do. We have calcium carbonate, CaCO3. And that's a solid, that's a solid. Calcium carbonate is the main component of chalk um, and limestone and all kinds of, uh, like, Sea creatures, marine animals with exoskeletons, diatoms, little plankton, algae. Uh, I guess they're not, not quite algae, but yeah, little planktons. The basic uh, primary producer of the food web in the ocean relies on calcium carbonate to make its skeleton, to make its skeleton, or its little exoskeleton. Um, so the primary uh, first trophic level producer of biomass in the ocean needs to be able to make calcium carbonate out of what's dissolved in the ocean. Um, and that'll become important later. We'll talk about that more at a certain point. So we're, we have calcium carbonate and we're going to add some heat. We're going to decompose that into calcium oxide, which is another solid and carbon dioxide, CO2, good old friend CO2, which is a gas. Now, what now? What now? We have a chemical equation. What now? Anyone? Balance the equation. Excellent. Yes. Absolutely, we need to balance this equation. So we'll write down our mass balance, see what we have on both sides of the equation. We have one calcium, we have one carbon, we have three oxygens. On the other side, calcium, carbon, and oxygen, we have one calcium, we have one carbon, we have three oxygens. Hey, we look pretty balanced to me. Yay, it's balanced. Hooray. Hooray, it's balanced. So remember that this gives us a mole ratio. A mole ratio of products and reactants. Why is that important? 
Well, this thing here, this ratio thing here, this thing, that ratio, let me make it more legible. I should probably make my, that thing there lets us convert one thing to another thing. It lets us convert stuff. Ratios let us, us, among other things, it lets us convert products to reactants. Let's us convert products to reactants when we're doing our uh, finding our when we when we're trying to find our limiting reactant. It lets us convert from products to reactants. All right. So we have our balanced molecular equation, and now what? We want percent yield if we have. So we have this given mass. We have a given mass. We want to take that given mass and we want to find out, first we want to find out what our theoretic, what, what do we know? What do we know? We know, we know our actual yield. We, 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 uh, we've recovered this mass. We know our actual yield. We want to know our percent yield, calculate the percent yield. So we need to know our theoretical yield from this reactant. We have a reactant and we, we need to find the theoretical yield of that reactant. So we'll start off with 235.0 grams of calcium carbonate, CaCO3, and we want to convert that because this is a mole ratio, we need to convert this value to moles so that we can convert the, that product, or sorry, so we can convert that reactant to a number of moles of product. So let's do that. Uh, what is, so we'll need the molar mass of calcium carbonate. And calcium is 40.078 grams per mole, 0.078, 0.078 grams per mole. Uh, carbon is 12.011 grams per mole and oxygen, three oxygens, is 47.997 grams per mole. 47.997 and thank you so much for calculating this in the chat. It makes things go so much smoother. 100.869 grams per mole for calcium carbonate. 100.869 grams per mole. So for every one, we're trying to get rid of grams of calcium carbonate and convert to moles of calcium carbonate. So we'll put one mole in the numerator, one mole of calcium carbonate. We put the thing we're converting to in the numerator and we put the thing we're trying to convert away from in the denominator. For every 100.869 grams CaCO3. All right. Grams of calcium carbonate cancels. That's why we put it in the denominator in our conversion ratio and we can now go ahead and divide let me see here two three five wait two three five point zero divided by one zero zero point eight six nine gives us two point three two nine seven five four, four, three, four moles of calcium carbonate. All right, are we okay? Is this okay? What do we need to do? Is there something we need to do? I'll give you a hint, there's something we need to do and it's not just rewrite the two so that it's more legible, but I will do that. What do we need to do? 
two point somebody says two point three three zero. Uh, yeah, it's sig figs, sig figs. So over here we have not three but four because that zero is a point of accuracy. It's a point of accuracy after the decimal place. There's a decimal place that's a point of accuracy. Point of accuracy, we have four sig figs. Four sig, I'm just gonna write four sig. So over here we count the, to the fourth place. We look at the fifth place. We see that it's greater than five. It's five or greater, so we'll round the whole thing up, which puts us at 2.330 moles of calcium carbonate. Excellent. Thank you all for participating in the chat. 2.330 moles of CaCO3. And you know what that means? You just got coconut mold. Share this with all your friends to totally... That wasn't fair. Um, that wasn't fair. That wasn't fair. I had to do it, though. Um, sorry. Um, so, 2.330 moles of calcium carbonate. And, uh, and what now? What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? What is what is this? So we have this this quantity. This is a this is a molar quantity. This is like the number of reaction units. It's like the number of reaction units. Reaction units. It's like how reaction units. That's what a mole is, right? It's sort of like a. It's like a number of. It's a number of particles. It's actually a number of particles, number of reaction units. It's like the units of reaction that we can get. So now we can compare that to the molar ratio in our... So we, we're trying to convert that to product. We have a reactant. We're trying to convert it to a product. So um, let's see, we we know we have, so we look back at our molar ratio in our molecular equation, and we find that for every, we're trying to convert away from moles of calcium carbonate and to uh, the moles of carbon dioxide. We're looking for moles of carbon dioxide so that we can compare it to the observed thing. So we're trying to find out what the theoretical yield is what the maximum amount of carbon dioxide we can get from this number of moles. So we look and we see that for every one mole, we're trying to convert to moles of CO2, and we see that for every one mole of CO2, we need one mole of calcium carbonate. So we're trying to convert to the thing that we put on the top, one mole CO2. for every one mole CaCO3. Moles of calcium carbonate cancels with moles of calcium carbonate. And if my calculations are correct, what we end up with is 2.330 moles of CO2. Did anyone else get 2.330 for that? I mean, I did it in my head. I might be, I might be wrong. Because I have like, you know, the memory of like, not like a goldfish, which has a really bad memory, but not like an elephant, which never forgets, but like something in the middle, like, I don't know, like, I guess like a human, like the memory of a human. Um, so anyway, did it, any, everyone else, everyone, you got, you got 2.330 mole, right? I hope so. I really hope so. Let's move on. Let's move on. So what is this? What did we just find? What did we just find? What did we find? What is this? What did we find? 
What is this? Moles of CO2, yes, but what? What is it? What have we been talking about? What is it? What did we find? What have we found? What have we done? It's the moles of CO2 from what? Like, limiting reaction. It's not the limit, it's, it, it's close. So there's only one reactant. So remember, CO2 is a product. CO2 is a product. If we go back to, like, remember that the limiting reactant has to be a reactant. It has to be a reactant. And in this, in this reaction, there's only one reactant. There's only one. Only one reactant. It's, it's not the case in every reaction, but in this one, there's only one. So what's the limiting reactant? What is it? What's the limiting reactant? It's that one, right? It's, that's, that's our limiting reactant. That's our limiting reactant. It's, it has to be. It's the only thing that is there. It's the limiting reactant. There's only one reactant. Only one reactant. Only reactant. So it's limiting. Therefore, three dots is therefore limiting. Therefore, it's the limiting reactant. But what is what is this that we found? What, like we had this mass of our reactant, it happens to be our limiting reactant. What have we found with this calculation? It's a quantity of CO2. We started with the amount of calcium carbonate that we have for the reaction. And we kind of assumed that all of it converted to product, right? That's what, that's what we did with this whole thing. Like this assumes that everything that goes in comes out the other side and that all of this, all of the reactant gets used up and turned into product. That's a, that's like a tacit assumption. This assumes that all of the product or all of the reactant turns into product. So what we have here is the theoretical yield. This here is the theoretical yield. It comes from the limiting reagent or limiting reactant. We did find out that this is the limit. I mean, we kind of knew, like we could have, we could have known because it's the only one. It's the only option. Nothing else is going to be limiting the reaction. Um, but this is our theoretical yield. It's how much CO2 we can possibly get out of our reaction. So what now? The, the question says calculate the percent yield if 97.5 grams of carbon dioxide is recovered. So we want to, that's our actual yield. This 97.5 grams is our actual yield. And then we can calculate percent yield by dividing our actual yield by our theoretical yield. So we have 97.5 grams of CO2, 97.5 grams of CO2 
97.5 grams of CO2 is our actual yield. Can we compare this actual yield to our theoretical yield right, right now as they are? You don't have to convert the theoretical yield to grams. We could, we could, we could, we could. We might not have to. We might not have to convert the theoretical yield to grams. There might be another way, but we do need to convert something. We need to convert something because if we try to, if we try to divide this thing, if we try to divide the actual yield by the theoretical yield, then we end up having like weird units. And we want, in the end, what we want is for our units, the units to cancel. We want the units to cancel. And I'll show you, I'll show you why. So, so let's, let's do that actually. Let's convert this theoretical yield to grams. We have 2.330 moles of CO2 and we want to convert it to grams, so we're going to convert away from moles, so we put the moles of CO2 on the bottom. Moles of CO2 goes in the denominator so that it will cancel, and for every one mole of CO2, we have, uh, what is it, 12 point, let's see, 12.011 plus uh, 31.998. So that's like, and these are both grams per mole. Grams per mole. And that's carbon, and that's two oxygen. And uh, we have nine, carry the one, no, nope, no, carrying there, zero, carry the one, zero, carry the one, four, four, four point zero zero nine. Don't scribble over things to make them more legible. Zero, zero, 009 grams per mole. So for every 44.009 grams of CO2, we have one mole of CO2. Moles of CO2 cancels just as we planned. Haha! -ha! And this gives us two, wait, calculator, 2.330 times 44.009102.54 grams of CO2. We have four significant figures. We have four significant figures here. We'll get rid of that one because it's less than five. So we'll just get rid of it. 102.5 grams CO2 is what? What is that again? Did I do my calculations correctly? Nine, zero, okay, the one. Zero, forty four point one nine. Yep. All right. All right. Twelve point oh five grams of CO two. Again, this is our theoretical yield. We just took this we moved it over to here. Whoops. Took this this value, we converted it to grams, so that's our theoretical yield. So we have our actual yield. We'll take actual yield over theoretical yield and we'll multiply it by 100 because we want a percentage. So our actual yield is 97.5 grams of CO2 and our theoretical yield is 102 0.5 grams of CO2. Look at this. Grams of CO2 cancels. We multiply it by 100 to get 
a percentage. We can't get a percentage if we still have a unit. We can't get a percentage if we still have the unit. These both need to be the same unit. The numerator and the, the denominator need to be both the same unit. Must be both the same unit. And from the chat, thank you chat, calculation is 95.12%. That's our percent yield. It's a comparison of the theoretical yield with the actual yield. It gives us an idea of how complete a reaction we have. All right. Let's look at another example. Um, I'm just going to copy and paste it real fast so that I'm not going to switch up my screen at all. Um, we'll do number three. three four, 344 grams of aluminum 3 oxide. I'm going to paste it here. 300 or 344 grams of aluminum. So this time, we have 344 point, just 344 grams of aluminum 3 hydroxide mixes with 780.2 grams of acetic acid, hydrogen acetate, to produce 200.0 grams of water and aluminum 3 acetate. What is the percent yield of water? What is the percent yield of water? So remember, uh, well, well, let's, let's, let's do this. So we have reaction, uh, reactants, this thing and this thing are our reactants. And over here we have our products, purple for products, water to produce water. That's not that legible. Oh, okay. Water and aluminum 3 acetate. What is the percent yield of water? Percent yield of water is the thing that we're looking for. And let's go. What's step one? What's step one? Step one's easy, right? Write a balanced molecular formula. Let's go. Aluminum 3 hydroxide. Aluminum hydroxide is OH minus, right? Aluminum 3 is Al3 plus. So we need three hydroxides to have a charge balanced compound. That's going to be solid. Solid. Just solid chunk of aluminum hydroxide. And that's going to mix with this big mass of acetic acid. Hydrogen acetate. Does anyone know the, uh, the chemical formula for acetic acid? Does anyone know this? Anyone? We'll talk more about this in the next unit, actually, but uh, it's going to be CH3COOH is a good way to write it. Kind of rolls off the tongue. CH3COOH. CH3COOH. Um, the, that H there is an acidic proton. That falls off into H plus and uh, CH. 3COO minus. So this here is the acetate ion, acetate, and that there is the acidic acidity. Um, and and there's other stuff that, that goes on with it too, but we won't we won't go into that this semester. CH3 
C O O H. Any idea what kind of reaction this is? By the way, this is a liquid. It's one of the it's it's a, it's moderately scary. It will catch fire. Um, this is called glacial acetic acid. This is not your friendly household vinegar. Um, this is acetic acid with no extra water. So it's a liquid and not aqueous because there's no water in this acetic acid. It's just acetic acid. Um, and it, it will catch fire and the liquid itself can cause some pretty serious burns if it touches your skin. All right, and that produces water. Hey, we know water, H2O. That's also a liquid. And aluminum three acetate. So Al, and since that's CH3COO minus, we'll write it like CH3CO2. Um, and we need three of those to balance out the aluminum and that one because we've made a bunch of water we made all this water that one will be aqueous so uh, let's uh, are we balanced that's our next step right we know we know that we need to balance this so let's look at how to do that. Aluminum, okay. OH, even though it recombines over here, here's how we're gonna think about this. This is H plus plus OH minus. Because um, as we recall from a previous lecture, like water is like low key ionic. And we're gonna talk a lot more about that in the next, the very next unit. The very next unit that we do, we're going to talk all about how, just how ionic water can be. And um, so we have aluminum, we have hydroxide, we have that, that acidic proton that falls off. And we have uh, that acetate, that CH3COO, CO2. And we'll have the same things on the other side, because what, what kind of, I know I asked what kind of reaction this is. As it turns out, this is looking like a double replacement reaction. Aluminum, hydroxide, hydrogen, and CH3CO2. Let's count them up. We have one aluminum. <clears throat> we have three OHs. We have that one hydrogen right there, and we have that one acetate that acetate on the other side we still have one aluminum we have one hydroxide we have one hydrogen one h plus and we have three of the acetate we have three acetate we have three acetate so i'm going to go ahead and put a three out in front of this acetic acid here so that we end up with three acetate here and and that also gives us three of that H. I said H, I went to write H because my hand doesn't always listen to my brain. Sometimes it just listens to the part of my brain that's saying things. All right, now we have three OHs and three H's and we'll need to balance those on this side and the way to do that is to make it water. And then three water. All right. And that's it. We're done with the balance. We're done with the mass balance. We're done with the mass balance. So what now? Well, we want to know the percent yield. So remember that percent yield, percent yield, 
is the, uh, the observed yield, or the actual yield, over the theoretical yield. And then, you know, times 100. So, to produce, we know the actual yield. We know the actual yield. 200 grams of water is the actual yield. We actually get 200 grams of water. We want to find out, we need to know our theoretical yield. We have a mass of aluminum hydroxide and a mass of acetic acid, so we need to find out what the theoretical yield is. In order to know the theoretical yield, we need to know the limiting reactant. So let's go about figuring out how much of... So let's suppose we convert... Okay, so let's, uh, let's take that 344 grams ALOH3 and also we have 780.2 grams that's a lot of acetic acid 780.2 grams of CH3COOH What do we have to do? Remember that we have a mole ratio here. We have a mole ratio. So we need to convert each of these from grams to moles. As before, we'll put the thing we're converting to on the top in the numerator, moles of Al OH3. That was scuffed. Moles. AL OH3. And aluminum has a molar mass of 26.982 grams. Two six point nine eight two. Yep, grams per mole. Uh, OH is fifteen point nine 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 plus one point zero zero eight, so that's seventeen point zero zero seven. which makes 3OH 51.021 grams per mole. When we add those two together, we get a number that I'm not going to do in long division form, two or long addition, 26.982 I could, I just don't want to. Plus 51.021 equals 78.003 grams of aluminum hydroxide, AlOH3, for every mole of aluminum hydroxide. All right. Grams of aluminum hydroxide cancels. And we can run those numbers through a calculator. 344 divided by 78.003 equals 4.4100. But looking here, we have only three sig figs. So we're going to look at the fourth number, see that it's less than five, and round to the nearest three digits. 
What's our units again? We have moles, the AL, parentheses, OH3. All right. Let's do the same thing with this one down here. Uh, we have 2 times carbon. We have 4 times hydrogen. And we have 2 times oxygen. 2 times carbon is 12.001, or 12.011 times 2, which is 24.022 grams per mole. Hydrogen is 1.008, so 4.032 grams per mole. And oxygen is 2 times 15.999, which gives us 31.998 again grams per mole. So when we add all of these together, we get the molar mass for every mole of CH3, 60.052. Thank you so much, CH3, COOH. For every mole of that, we need 60.052 grams of CH3. COOH. Grams of acetic acid cancel. Grams of acetic acid cancel. And we're left with 76, sorry, 780.2 divided by 60.052 gives us 12.992. Nine, nine, two. Here we have four significant figures. So we want to count to, if we go to the fourth, we look at the fifth, we see that it's less than five, so we round down to 12.99 moles CH3CO. OH. All right. So we know how many moles we have of each. Now what? Now what? Well, we, we need to know which one is going to limit our reaction. We want to know which one we run out of first. We want to know how much, which one we run out of first. So how do we know that? We know, well, we can we can use this mole ratio that we set up to convert these, so, so to pretend to like be like, all right, like we have, suppose, remember when we wrote this yesterday, we're like, suppose we convert all of each of these. Suppose we convert, suppose all of each is converted to product. That gives us our Suppose all of each all of each that's 100% all 100% 100% of each is converted to product What's the product that we're, we're worried about? It's water, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna use this molar ratio to say that, all right, for every one mole of aluminum hydroxide, we can convert that to three moles of water. And it's a conversion ratio. So we're gonna try to, we're gonna get the thing that we're converting away from on the bottom in the denominator and the thing that we're converting to will be in the numerator. So we, we have for every mole of aluminum hydroxide, ALOH3, we get three moles of water. 
We got that from the ratio in our molecular formula. For every one mole of aluminum hydroxide, if we, if we, if for every one mole, we can get three moles of H2O. All right, moles of aluminum hydroxide cancels with moles of aluminum hydroxide. We're left with three moles of water forever times 4.41, which gives us three times 4.41 is like 13.21 moles of H2O. But in this, in this one, we have only three significant figures. We look at the fourth place, it's less than five. We round it down to three significant figures. 13.2 moles of water can be formed with that quantity of this reactant, aluminum hydroxide. Now we're supposing that 100% of each is converted to product, so we'll do the same thing for our acetic acid. We're, we're going to put, we're going to look at this molecular equation that we wrote, this balanced molecular equation, and we see that for every three moles, for every three moles of acetic acid, we get three moles of water. So for every, we put the thing we're converting away from in the denominator, every three moles of uh, acetic acid, CH3COOH, we get three moles of water. Moles of acetic acid will cancel with moles of acetic acid. And then the, three the threes cancel, the threes cancel, so we're left with 12.99 moles of H2O. All right. So, which one? Two questions. What's our theoretical yield and what is our limiting reactant? What's our theoretical yield and what is our limiting reactant? Acetic acid, correct, is our limiting reactant. So what's our theoretical yield? What is our theoretical yield? Remember that the theoretical yield is the max amount of product if 100% of the limiting reactant is converted to product. So it's the amount of product we get if 100% of our limiting... So we've just supposed that 100% of each of these is converted to product, right? So the limiting reactant, the product that can be formed from the limiting reactant should be our theoretical yield. So we've said that acetic acid is our limiting reactant So this should be our theoretical yield. All right. How do we know that it's the limiting reactant? How do we know? How do we know? Remember what we said, it's the lower one. 
the least, it's the thing that runs out first. It's the thing that runs out first. So like while we're, while we're still making, we're still making water up here, like we have another, you know, 0.3 moles of water that we can make at the point where we run out of acetic acid. 0.3, something like that. I don't know. I can't math. It's too early in the morning. It's 12.30 in the afternoon, but it's still too early in the morning. So now we have a theoretical yield. We have a theoretical yield, but what do we want to know? We want to know our percent yield. So we know our, our actual yield. Our actual yield is 200 grams of water, and we have a theoretical yield in moles of water. So remember last time when we took our theoretical yield and we, we turned it into grams? Let's do the other thing this time. Let's take our observed yield and, and let's turn it into moles. So we'll take that 200 grams of our actual yield. And we're going to turn it into moles. So for every mole of H2O, we have, uh, what is it, 15.99 plus 2.016, 15.999 plus, it's like 18.015 grams of H2O. I didn't calculate that, I remembered it. That's, that's not fair. Um, for every mole of H2O, moles of water will cancel. I did that wrong. I set that up wrong. <laughs> Keeping, keep, you get 3198 moles. I set it up wrong. 200 grams of water. We're trying to cancel grams, trying to convert to moles. Moles should be on the top. Trying to convert to, should be in the numerator. Grams. 18.015 grams of H2O. Grams of water should cancel. That's why that's why I do this like that's why because like I caught it. I was like, cancel wait, that shouldn't cancel. This one can cancel, so here we go. So I know I've set it up the correct way because my units are canceling. Equals 12.507. I even wrote this wrong because this isn't 200, it's 200.0. 200 point zero. 200 point zero grams of water. I went to check the significant figures and I was like, wait, that, all right, 12.5078, moles of H2O. All right, how many significant figures? How many? How many do we keep here? A four, a three, a four. Remember, the decimal is a point of precision. Decimal is a point of precision. Stuff to the right of it counts. That, that zero to the right of the decimal is significant. So we have four sig figs. One, two, three, four. Look at the fifth one. It's greater than five. So we'll round that up and erase, erase, erase the rest. Do, 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 do. We'll remember that's moles of H2O. So we have 12.51 moles of H2O. 
And what is that? That's our that's our actual yield, right? That's our we took our actual yield. This is actual. So this is our actual yield. Actual yield. And now we can compare. We have actual over theoretical times 100. We have a theoretical yield. We have an actual yield. We have 12.51 moles of H2O over 12.99 moles of H2O moles of H2O will cancel, moles of H2O will cancel, moles of H2O cancel, and we are left with a dividing problem. 12.51 divided by 12.99 equals 96 point oh I, f I forgot one thing we need to multiply it by 100 96 point three zero four Uh-oh. I just... I just caught us out here. I don't know who... So whoever... You see this number here, 12.51? I just ran that through the calculator. 200 divided by 18.015 is not 12.51. Oh no, oh no, it's way different. That's 11.1018. One, 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 five, five, it's way different. Again, rounded to four significant figures, we have 11.10 moles of H2O. So we need to, let's go back. 11.10 moles of H2O. Times 100. It's not 96%. It's 85.45 zero. Eighty-five point four five zero percent. Once again, four significant figures. Look at the fifth. Less than five round down. Eighty-five point four five percent is our percent yield. Any questions? We have like eight minutes, I think. Is it eight minutes? Eight minutes. Let's uh, let's talk about the lab. Let's see. I'm gonna share my screen on the video. Um, we have oh, we have three minutes. We have three minutes. Um, let's look at the lab. Let's look at the lab. Um, the lab says, this one has a procedure you can do with your home lab kit. It's 
this thing here. It's this thing. In, it has a, a filter paper and a piece of, of uh, copper wire and a coffee stirrer and like a little bag of a white crystalline solid. And, um, but it's the one with the, it's the one with the copper wire, the one with the copper wire and, and the filter paper, copper wire and filter paper. Um, you can, you can work in pairs. You can work in pairs. You, if you want, you can work individually. Um, it, you know, it, it can be less work to work in pairs. Um, your partner has to be a different person than the magnesium oxide lab partner. Still has to be someone from this class period. There's a video, um, and the, there's a procedure in the appendix of the lab uh, document. So I follow, in the video, I follow the procedure in the appendix. There's a few things that are a little bit different because we have labware and extra chemicals that we can't send home. Um, so watch the video to get the data for your report. Um, the video has the data because uh, we can't give everyone a, an analytical balance. Like we have a class set of those and that's, they're really, they're expensive and hard to get. We can't send 130 of them home because we don't have them. They don't, that's not a, that nobody, nobody has those. Um, I mean, I, yeah, and anyway. Uh, and then there's the video, the video. Uh, it's like almost 11 minutes long, but it was cut down from over two hours of footage. Please watch it, enjoy it. Um, it's, it's fun to watch, I think, like parts of it at least are fun to watch. Parts of it kind of drag, but um, I could have done better, but parts of it are really good. Um, and here's the lab. So uh, there's also, oh, there's also the rubric, the rubric. So do follow the rubric, use the rubric to to guide your reporting. Um, single replacement, names, class period. I gave you a whole purpose. Be sure to balance this equation. That equation will come up later. Write your introduction, hypothesis, if, then, and so forth. Background, write your background. If you use addition, so there are some home materials that aren't in the kits that we kind of like hope that you'll have. Um, if you don't, let us know. Um, there are additional materials in the video lab that you won't have at home, but that are listed here just so that you, you know and you can talk about them maybe in uh, the methods and setup. Modify procedures to represent the actual steps you took. Record changes in a contrasting color so that we can see them, please. Um, procedures. Silver nitrate will stain everything it touches. That includes your skin. If you get silver nitrate on your skin, don't try to scrub it off. Just let it, let it kind of fade naturally. It'll go away eventually, but don't, like if you try to scrub it off, you'll just hurt yourself. Um, take pictures to record your, your reaction. Um, while you're waiting for the reaction to proceed, watch the lab video and fill out the data table. Um, don't discard the blue reaction liquid, uh, at least not down the sink. Um, it can be toxic to plants and animals. The filter paper, uh, once you filter everything, will be kind of like grainy and, and light and can be scattered easily. So keep it someplace safe uh, to, to let it dry. Um, keep the copper wire with the paper, and then we want pictures. We want pictures of your final, final product and the copper wire after the reaction. Um, there's a data table for, with observations. We want a caption. We want a title. Balance, there it is again, balanced chemical equation. And here we go with all the stuff that we've spent the last week and a half going over in class. We want mass and moles of the copper, mass and moles of the silver nitrate, calculations to determine the limiting reactant and the theoretical yield of the silver. Also calculate the percent yield of the silver. Again, these numbers will be like the, the mass, the masses of each of these things will be in the video. 
Uh, limiting reactant, what's the limiting reactant? What's the theoretical yield? Discuss the percent yield, what does it mean? And explain why not all of the silver nitrate reacted. Because not all of it's gonna react. If you think that it does, if you think more reacted, keep in mind, there's gonna be a number at the end of the, of the video. There's a number at the end of the video that's the product plus the paper because I, I took the mass of the filter paper and then I wrote the mass of the filter paper on the filter paper. But remember to subtract the mass of the filter paper from the final mass of the product in the paper. Otherwise, otherwise, we'll just get a repeat of the magnesium oxide lab where so many people turned the entire crucible into magnesium and were like, we have a mold of magnesium. We didn't have a mold of magnesium. We didn't. We didn't. So, so don't fall into the paperweight error. Don't do it. Remember to subtract the paper from the mass of the product with the paper. All right. And then there's the video lab procedure in the appendix. Silver metal. You get silver. You get a little bit of silver out of this. It's valuable. I wouldn't just ditch it. It's up to you. Keep it like it. Again, it's like kind of spiky. Anyway. So that's it. That's, uh, that's our story. That's the day. That's the last class before spring break. Last class before spring break. Enjoy your break. This is all due. This assignment, the lab, the lab and the percent yield assignment are both due the first day back after break. March 22nd. March 22nd. Both things are due. Both things are due. So, be safe, have fun, have a great break. Thank you for staying over. We're 15 minutes past the end of class. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you.